All right, welcome back. Um, we've spoken several times about languages, particularly artificial languages, and today we're going to talk a little bit more about that concept and how you might go about encoding a language. So anyway, what is a language? Well, it's just a symbol set. So we've got a, a bunch of symbols and a way of creating strings from those. So English is a language and Japanese is a language. But most of what we'll talk about in here are going to be artificial languages. So for example, suppose that you have a, a, a coin, a two-sided coin, and you flip it. What are the possible symbols that you might generate? Well, heads and tails. And you can represent those however you like. Up and down, true or false, zero and one. But anyway, strings in this language then are just sequences of H's and T's or however you represent them. Okay, a second language is, suppose you've got a six-sided die and you're rolling that. Well, here you've got more symbols, right? You've got six symbols, uh, all whatever's marked on the six sides of the die, so it's probably one through six. And then a string in the language is just sequences of those symbols. Okay, what we want is a way of encoding a language, uh, typically a binary encoding, because that's what we use in, in the world of computers, sending things across channels. And we want our encoding to have three characteristics. We want it to be lossless. What does that mean? It means that if we're in, if the sender is in a room engaging in these experiments, like flipping the coin or tossing the die, and is recording those things, we want to be able to send those to the receiver in such a way that the receiver can completely recover the sequence of symbols. So there's no lost information. That's the first thing. The second thing, we want our encoding to be uniquely decodable. What that means is that the receiver gets uh, a, a string of bits, zeros and ones. He's able to recover unambiguously what the sender was intending to send. That, that is, for any string of these bits, there's not two different ways in which you can read them. And then finally, we want it to be streaming. That is, we want to send the bits one right after another. We don't want to have any breaks. OK, so let's see what, what this might look like. So suppose we have our six-sided die, and we roll it repeatedly. Um, we might use any of the following codes on this table, right? So we have the, the naive in, encoding, and that just uses three bits. Three bits is enough for six possibilities. Or we might use either code one or code two. Right? So if you think about code one, for example, it's uniquely decodable, and I can make the following argument that it is. If I see a zero, then I just write down immediately that, I've, that, that the roll was a one. Okay? Otherwise, I have to look at the next bit. And if it's a zero, I, look, I, I write down a two. Otherwise, I look at the third bit, and so on. Right? And so if you, if you parse or read the string from left to right, you can recover completely the role. And uh, the same thing is, is true of, of code two, right? So which of these is the best encoding? Well, it depends on the circumstances. If, for example, you knew that role one came up vastly more often than any of the others, maybe you want to use encoding one because it assigns the fewest bits to the thing that's going to come up the most often. But if you knew that all of the, all three of them were all of the, excuse me, all of the roles were equally likely, then maybe you just want to use the naive encoding. Uh, we'll, we'll investigate this further as we go along. A sufficient but not necessary condition for unique decodability is the property of being prefix-free. All three of these encodings are prefix-free. And what that means is that the encoding for any symbol is not an initial prefix of the encoding for any other symbol. Okay. So, what would it mean for it not to be prefix-free? Well, here's a simple encoding for a, a language that contains the symbols A, B, and C. Well, we, we've assigned the code 1 to A and 0 to B and 1, 0 to C. Well, what's wrong with this? Well, here's the problem. If, I, if the receiver gets a 1 followed by a 0, he won't know in general whether that's encoding a C or whether it's encoding an A followed by a B. And you can see that this is not prefix-free because the encoding for an A is an initial prefix of the encoding for C. And that's, that's generally a bad property. So we want to avoid this sort of encoding. Now notice that the property of being prefix-free is sufficient for it to be uniquely decodable, but it's not necessary. For example, in the, in the example at the bottom of this slide, 
Uh, here's kind of an odd encoding for a language where we only have symbols A and C. And so A is a one and C is, I don't know, eight ones followed by a zero. Why anybody would use this encoding, I don't know. But this actually is uniquely, de uniquely decodable. But if you see a sequence of ones, you've got to look eight symbols ahead to see if it's followed by a zero to uh, decide whether you're at the beginning of a sequence of A's or you're at the beginning of a C. And this is generally considered to be a bad property because it's very hard to parse something like this. And you may have to look arbitrarily far ahead and then back up. And that's a bad property for a parser. OK. So how do you come up with an efficient encoding? Well, we'll talk about that in a bit. But the, in, in general, what you want to do is use the fewest possible bits for the symbols which are most likely in the language. So example, if you look at, at Morse code, here's some, here's some uh, Morse code for a few letters, right? E is a, is a dot, and S is three dots, and T is a dash, and so on, right? Well, this seems to fail our criteria because if you had three dots in a row, how would you know whether, if that was three E's or an S? Well, it turns out that Morse code does not satisfy our criteria because it's not streaming. And that means, uh, in this case, that there's a break between each letter in Morse code. And so uh, the receiver can distinguish those capabilities, or those, those, those letters, or those possibilities. Uh, and that's what we want to avoid. So Morse code isn't a, good, isn't a good encoding from our perspective, though it works fine for telegraphs. Right. There, is a, there are some algorithms that allow you to find an efficient encoding. In fact, Huff, Huffman coding is one such algorithm. Uh, and Huffman coding is guaranteed to find an efficient code if you know the probabilities of symbols in the language. OK, so what have we said? Well, we use the word language to de describe any scheme for generating a sequence of symbols or strings of symbols. And for any language, uh, what we want is to be able to find an efficient binary encoding which has three properties. It has to be lossless, uniquely decodable, and streaming. And Huffman encoding will provide such an encoding for us, but you have to know the probabilities of the various symbols in the language. Thank you.